Um, so we welcome you all uh, on behalf of Virginia Theological Seminary and our lifelong learning department, um, which um, is home to our eFormation learning community. This is uh, an eFormation learning community webinar today, uh, and also home to Building Faith. So our monthly webinars alternate between eFormation, which is kind of a more digital oriented topics and building faith, which is tends to be more faith formation topics. Um, and so this month is uh, eFormation and the topic of visual, um, using images and visuals for, uh, for digital ministry. And I wanna invite us to begin with a word of prayer. This prayer comes from Sarah Bessie from her new collection, A Rhythm of Prayer, a collection of meditations for renewal. And it's a prayer um, about learning to love the world again. So let's pray. God of herons and heartbreak, teach us to love the world again. Teach us to love extravagantly, knowing it may, it will, break our hearts and teach us that it is worth it. God of pandemics and suffering ones, teach us to love the world again. God of loneliness and longing, of brush fires and wilderness, of soup kitchens and border towns, of snowfall and children, teach us to love the world again. Amen. Uh, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists for today, Mary Button and Joe Nygaard Owens. Um, we've had some great conversations already preparing for this webinar. I'm so excited for you to get to know them more and to get to know their work and learn from them. Uh, I'm Keith Anderson. Uh, I'm the host for our webinar. I'm the Associate for Digital Content at the Lifelong Learning Department at VTS. Um, uh, Mary Button is a, an artist and a current intern, right, uh, but just about to graduate from United Lutheran Seminary coming up uh, this weekend. Uh, so congratulations, Mary. Um, and Joe Nygaard Owens is a, a ordained minister and uh, the founder of Vibrant Church Communications. You're going to hear much more about each of them in their presentations today. Uh, and they'll be our leaders, our guides, um, as, we, um, as we make our way through this time together. Uh, so for our outline, uh, we'll follow a typical pattern that we use here at uh, Lifelong Learning. So opening the webinar, um, what this webinar is about and why, and then Joe is gonna present for the first part of the webinar, and then we're gonna pause for your questions. And then Mary is going to present, and then we'll pause again for questions, uh, and then we'll talk about some um, tools and resources, um, and we'll again make those available after the webinar. So lots of time for questions. Um, feel free to put the, your questions in the chat in the Q&A at any point during the webinar, and then we'll come to them as we pause for those questions in conversation. Um, so why this webinar? Um, we know that visual media are incredibly important um, in social media spaces, for websites, even in our worship spaces today. Um, so we know this is something that builds a lot of engagement and is a real source of inspiration. But um, a lot of congregations and ministry leaders struggle with how to create them, how to curate them, where to find them. Um, and so um, I'm a Lutheran, so I would just like to say we're very wordy people, like we like words, and we use a lot of them, and um, we don't always go to images, so um, words are our kind of first language, but the first language of the internet is certainly becoming images, videos, uh, in, you know, Instagram, TikToks. So, um, so Joe and Mary today are going to talk, talk about what they do using visual media um, so that we can um, learn what we might be able to do. and. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, lean on their expertise when it comes to using their materials. I've personally used Joe and Mary's materials in our worship services and for our congregations. We use Joe's um, Lenten micro practices, which you're going to hear about as a, as a, and, and Advent Lenten practice, micro practices um, at our church for devotional and faith formation. And we use Mary's um, pandemic stations of the cross for our Good Friday worship service. So i uh, I'm not just the host, I definitely uh, have benefited a lot from their wisdom and their creativity. Okay, and um, with that, I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Joe. Well, hello, um, I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Thanks for showing up on this Thursday afternoon and uh, I appreciate your time. So 
uh, in the beginning, I was a pastor. And uh, the picture that's there is from, my husband is also uh, an Episcopal priest. So I'm a Presbyterian minister, he's an Episcopal priest. Uh, and we have taken times where we both serve churches together. Um, but then as we started to have those two lovely children who are actually a lot older than they are in that picture, um, we discovered that uh, two pastors in two churches can be too much. Uh, so at various times within um, our time together, uh, I have taken a step back from serving as an ordained minister. Uh, and church is the place that I know, it's the place that I love. And so I ended up finding a job as a communications director. Uh, I knew about 50% of what to do in that job when I took the job. Uh, and so I started reading books and the person who passed the job to me was wonderful and she gave me some great resources, um, but I had uh, no design experience. Now I've done lots of multimedia work and done video editing and photography and some animation, but I had never taken a design class or an art class past like middle school. <laughs> so I would never have considered myself a designer. I say this because there's, if there's hope for me, there's hope for you guys too. It's something that uh, lots of us can learn. So my predecessor in my first communications job passed me a book called uh, non-designers design book. And that'll be sent out in the link of resources. It's by Robin Williams. Um, and I read it cover to cover. And she lays out some basic principles of design. Um, but what she says is just get in there, take these principles, start doing it. I would have um, a little sticky note on my computer that I had all of her principles of design. And so as I was working on graphics for the church I was working on, I would literally go through and like, okay, have I done alignment? Have I done proximity? Have I done, you know, and just go through the list uh, to make sure that I had covered all of these things. Uh, and it just takes time. So if this is, if visual arts is not your native creative language, and I would guess that it is for Mary, but it is not my native creative language. I'm a dancer by trade. Um, it can, principles of it can be learned. So it's, it's just like learning any other language. Uh, you get the foundations and then you keep practicing and you keep practicing and iterating and getting feedback and talking with those who do speak it natively to get feedback from them. Um, and so through that process, and this is a multi-year process, um, my design skills got better and better. Now, I know my limits, and that's fine, <laughs> but I can create some lovely things. Um, and it was in, let's see here. I had served a church in North Carolina until, oh, I think it was 2017. And at that point, once again, we discerned for our family that it was just too much for both my husband and for me to be in a church um, serving at the same time. And so I took a step back and thought about starting my own business. I had a first run and it failed. Uh, so <laughs> I took another step back and in 2020, Vibrant Church Communications was launched and we'll go ahead and, all right. So I put this hedgehog on my website because it's a silly picture. There's a lot that is being said in this picture. A picture's worth a thousand words, so we should make the most of them. Um, as Keith said, we live in a visual culture um, and the people around us expect to have these visual, um, visual stories told to them. So our non-denominational and evangelical friends have because they didn't have their brand identity of, hey, we're a mainline church, we'll just open the doors and you can come in. Because from the beginning, they had to work on their marketing, they knew that visuals mattered. So when they're sending out mailers, when they're creating their website, when they're doing anything that communicates in a visual way, their designs are gonna be top notch. And as mainlines, we've relied on that brand identity of, oh, we're Episcopalian, we're Presbyterian, we're Lutheran. 
and folks will just show up because that's what they've known, but that isn't true anymore. And so as we learn to market ourselves, for lack of a better word, um, we have got to start figuring out how our visuals matter. So we'll go to the next slide. So part of what I wanted to do with, oh, um, part of what I wanted to do with uh, Vibrant Church Communications is to create products that churches can use ready-made um, that help them look good. So I did some stickers back in August for back to school and it was just a fluke uh, and they took off. And so a friend of mine was like, oh, well, you need to do something else. So what can you get out there? And I had written 30 Days Thankful, uh, a booklet for my church back in North Carolina. And it was well received by children, youth and adults. The whole congregation loved it. So I thought, well, let's take it and, and see what we can do. And on a whim, I decided to create social media images from the content that was in a booklet. And from there, uh, it just took off. And I realized, oh, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I realized that, you know what, this is something we really need. Churches don't have time to create tons and tons of content for social media, but they want something quality. And again, when you go to a place like Lightstock, which I love, um, but if you go to Lightstock and some of their um, like Sunday social TV, places like that, uh, the theology isn't in line with our mainline traditions. And so there's a need there as well. So I have found this little niche uh, of creating uh, social media images with kind of bite-sized content. And I'm still brand new in this business, but this is where I am right now. So I did 30 Days Thankful and it was really well received. And so we'll go to the next one. And then I did Advent images and my daughter and I had a great time painting the backgrounds of these. So we hand painted these backgrounds. Um, and then I digitized everything. So it was uh, great. And again, churches responded well to these and both 30 Days Thankful and Advent have a combination of quotes, scripture passages and songs that we would rotate between to give kind of a broad experience of the topics. Um, and then after that, it was time for Lent and uh, I did Lenten micro practices. So again, I did, I wrote these a long time ago for a church and they were well received. And honestly, this year, it just wasn't the time for me particularly. So I, I like to create things that I'll use. <laughs> it wasn't the time for me to go super deep into Lent. I needed something that I could just pick up and do. And it was there for me. Sometimes it had more effort. Uh, and it was, oh, thank you. Uh, it was nice to have, um, you know, I, in, the, in the opening notes of the booklet, I wrote in there, I'm like, you know what? You don't have to do every single one of these. You are no holier if you do, or if you skip some days. And just even giving myself that grace was nice. <laughs> so as of today, let's go to that next slide. I just launched something brand new. Um, and this is words to build on. Um, so words of scripture for remembrance and reflection. So again, I created this for myself. Um, I, I feel like there's so much swirling around us and I so appreciate those who go so deep and I rely on those resources. Um, but right now, oh, thank you, Cindy. Um, I rely on these, sometimes I, I need something that's, again, that bite size, and I wanted to be reminded of all of my favorite scripture passages. Maybe you had that Bible when you were a teenager that you just went through and highlighted, and I would go through and flip through those pages and see all my highlights, and I use the digital Bible for the most part now, uh, and so I don't see those highlights. 
and I wanted to be reminded, and I wanted to find a way to share these with my daughter. She's 11 now. And so I wanted to say, here, these are some of my favorite passages. And I asked my Facebook group uh, what some of their favorite passages are. Uh, and clearly, there are far more than I could fit into this resource. So probably there'll be a second edition coming. Um, but I took you know, a short scripture passage, paired it with um, uh, some, something to help you reflect on it. And I was hoping to take those reflections that can be done for your own self, but also as a wider community, because both are important. We don't wanna lose the personal reflection, but we also want to connect our faith to our wider world. So I, over the breadth of the images, um, that is my goal. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for linking to my Facebook group. Um, it is a closed group, so you have, and you do have to answer the questions to be admitted, because I, I keep a, I don't want crazy people in there, um, but you're not crazy, so just answer the questions and I'll let you in. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. These are these are really beautiful images uh, that I I want to share with people, and they can be used in so many different ways. I've got um, tons of different ways that you can use them, and I'm sure you creative people will come up with even more. So I think I'm at my time for questions. So. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, all right, I just messaged our communications person with the link to the new set. <laughs> like, how and soon can we get you? If you're on my email list, um, if you get on my email list, I give out uh, discount codes. So right. get on the email list. <laughs> Excellent. Um, again, if you have questions, um, you can share them in the Q and A. Um, and if you have, uh, there's been some great feedback and observations and responses and um, people sharing about how they've used the micro practices uh, as well. So um, great. Um, and Sarah has a question that uh, she just submitted. So do you have, do you plan to do something for Advent 2021? Is it too early to ask? <laughs> <laughs> it is not too early to ask. Um, yes, I am planning to do, I'm planning to keep going on those seasonal things, but then also start offering things that aren't tied to seasons. Um, and one of my goals is to create more communications training because I love the design aspect, but I love the communications aspect too. How do we communicate effectively with our words uh, and combining visuals, uh, you know, things like MailChimp training, how to write good emails, you know, those sorts of things. I've been sick for the last few months, uh, so I'm just getting healthy again. Um, so hopefully those will be coming out soon. Great. Um, Cameron asks, uh, do you have recommendations on accessing the design backgrounds and fonts, et cetera? So, ah, so I, um, Unsplash is a great place. Um, Pixabay, uh, Lightstock. So if you're willing to pay and you need religious focused images, I love Lightstock. I started a subscription to Lightstock maybe seven years ago. And so I got grandfathered in. So I pay their prices. If you get a package, it's not so bad. Um, and I think they're good for a while. Uh, so I recommend that. I will I have some lists together. Um, so I will send those out for fonts. I love font squirrel and defont. Um, those are defont.com. Those are some great places. Uh, and then if you're willing to pay for fonts, um, there are a lot of good, relatively cheap resources for paid fonts as well. So I will put those together and those will get sent out in the resources tomorrow. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question. Um, <laughs> what have you, you know, you've got, you've iterated, a, you know, um, kind of four different rounds here. So like, what have you learned in the process of, you know, creating these, putting these out into the world? either you know, in the way that people use them and ways you expected or didn't expect or, or creatively in your process? Like what, what have you kind of learned along the way? That's a great question. So if you saw the 30 days thankful images were like really plain and they've gotten a little bit more complex uh, since then. Um, this last round, I'll admit I, I've 
finally got into Procreate. If you don't know Procreate, it is an app that you can download onto an iPad. Uh, so I have a super old iPad mini, which is really small. And I, my, my iPad is so old that it doesn't connect to an Apple Pencil. So I had a knockoff pencil. Um, so these are kind of some handicaps. I'm just saying you can do it. Uh, with the resources that you have. But Procreate is a really powerful tool. Um, I bought a couple of brushes um, to use. And the main thing is that remembering that it's a process. Uh, I liked, and I bet Mary can speak to this a lot more. It, it'd be so nice if you could come to your computer, to your tablet, to your paper and be like, this is the idea. And it's going to be great the first time I do it. No. Uh, to come to where I, to the published images, I mean, it takes iteration after iteration after iteration. And hopefully it looks relatively easy by the time you see it, but it's after weeks of tweaking and designing and iterating and iterating until you land on the thing that, <laughs> yeah, I don't have the state of the art tools. I did order a new iPad though. Um, but you can do it without it. That's just, you can do a lot with a little. I, I want you to know that. Um, so you can get there and, and just trust that process. So you start somewhere and then take a step away. You come back. Oh, let me tweak it. It's just like you do with sermon work or any other creative work that you put out into the world. It doesn't happen magically the first time. Um, and I just, you know, I keep files of things that give me inspiration. I have Pinterest boards. I have a whole paper file in my house of postcards that I get and mailings and all sorts of things that I'll go back. And I love Canva. I don't work in Canva because it doesn't do everything I want it to do. Um, but they've got great designs, great, great stuff. So Canva is one of the best things that's happened to church design for sure. So love Canva. All right. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, agree on Canva. Yeah, ditto. Um, we're going to, yeah, continue with um, Mary's part of the presentation. Again, um, you can ask a question uh, for either presenter at any time during the webinar. So go ahead and just go ahead and put that in the Q&A. And uh, when we pause again, we'll, we'll, um, we'll discuss this. Thanks. Uh, Mary, over to you. Yeah, hi, I'm so um, thankful to be here with everyone. Um, my name is Mary Button. And um, as Keith mentioned, I'm, I'm currently um, in the last throes of my MDiv. I graduate tomorrow. Um, but I, I wanna give a little bit of my background before I just launch right in. So um, my, I have a BFA, a, BFA um, a Bachelor of Fine Arts from NYU. Uh, in photography and imaging. And by the time that I graduated, I was working primarily like in mixed media, like I do now. Um, but uh, when I entered the program, <laughs> when I was applying, my dream was to be a photojournalist. And so even though I've moved into a different medium, my work very much engages with photojournalism. And my background as a, as a photographer, that training as a photographer has been really essential for me in part because um, I very rarely work in like singular pieces. I tend to work in series. Um, and, you know, uh, to, to Joe's point about, you know, you just have to keep working, keep working, keep working. That's what photography is too, right? Like you, I mean, you can take, th you know, shoot three rolls of film I'm dating myself, you know, and have one image that turns out really well. And so that's just part and parcel of like the photography process is, is to know that you just have to keep working. So while I was at NYU, I became really interested in the intersections of politics and religion. So um, I grew up the daughter of a Lutheran pastor. Um, and when I moved to New York and I joined a Lutheran church there, it was really the first time that I heard like liberation theology, that I heard um, a really uh, gospel centered message that took into consideration, you know, the, the larger politic, global politics and engage with social issues 
in a way that, you know, uh, I didn't see happen in my church growing up. And so that was primarily what my work was about, was about sort of commenting on um, religion. And then I received a fellowship when I graduated to pursue a project that was creating artist books. So sort of transforming books with painting on the inside and sewing. And, um, and I was collecting hymnals and Sunday school books and all sorts of materials from different communities where there had been uh, a series of racially motivated church arsons and was creating work out of the, the things that I collected in those places. And that's really when I became interested enough in theology to want to do um, a master's degree. So I have a master of theological studies from Emory University and um, my area of, of concentration was Christian ethics. And um, I became very interested in particular in narrative ethics and the way that um, stories can, can inform how we make decisions every day. So that's when I did my first Stations of the Cross series. It was when um, I was a student at Emory and it was a very sort of specific type installation in the chapel. Um, each, so I, I used the traditional 14 Roman Catholic stations. Um, and part of that is that I, you know, I think that the richness of the storytelling tradition um, is, I think, really compelling, even though, uh, you know, not all of those stations are, uh, not all of those images, like Veronica wipes the face of Jesus is not actually in scripture. Um, and in the chapel, it was set up so that there was sort of a story that that was told about um, about the life of a Haitian immigrant in the United States. And then as people went from station to station, there were little tiles and they added tiles and created mosaics as they went. Um, now, since then, I've done eight other series and they kind of represented the shift between between making sort of political Christian art to making devotional art that like consider, you know, the gospel is political. So I, I make no apologies for, for the engagement with, um, with politics that my work, that my work does. Um, so on the left, that's one of my stations from uh, my Jesus at the Border series, which um, tells, you know, it, the, the first station begins in, you know, Central America. And then as the stations progress, um, it tells us the story of migrants coming into the United States. Um, that was my 2019 series. And then on the right, that's um, Jesus is laid in the tomb from my pandemic um, series. And um, on the right, you know, the, uh, the imagery is around the Virgin of Guadalupe. And, and I, um, I actually traveled to the border prior to doing this. Um, and I was, I participated in leaving these, um, you know, there's a, there are a couple of different organizations that leave gallons of water um, in the Sonoran desert for migrants making that trip. And then on the right, this was a very, um, I thought compelling, based on a very compelling photograph of a mortuary worker in one of the refrigerated trucks during the pandemic outside um, of a New York hospital. And he was, he was photographing and, and FaceTiming with um, the family of this woman and, and providing them with these uh, photographs before she was cremated. Um, so one of the things about the series is that they're available on my website. And um, like this past year, over a hundred congregations use the pandemic hope series either as, you know, they printed off posters and did sort of pop-up exhibitions or um, they used them in virtual Holy Week services. So, um, you know, this devotional aspect of different communities using the artwork to be in prayer together is really um, important to me. And it very much um, stems from this um, 
you know, Karl Barth said that you, know, you should read the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. And so this work kind of comes from that commitment that I've, that I've made to myself to, to engage with scripture um, in the real, <laughs> the real world and not to, not to read it um, isogetically. So um, yeah, let's move on to the next one. I've got a lot of, woo, I don't know what happened to those <laughs> to those photographs. <laughs> uh, so I'm very sorry. You can go to my website and see Season of Creation. Oh, they didn't look like that <laughs> when I dropped them in. It's okay. Um, so if you go to my website, you can see uh, these different um, art installations that I've done over the years in different congregations. Um, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> Um, and so this particular uh, exhibition was Season of Creation. And so that's a new, uh, it's a new uh, season uh, that the World Council of Churches has suggested um, for kind of the period um, in ordinary time leading up to the, uh, um, to the feast day of St. Francis. And so I made these with my volunteers, these very beautiful silk, banners that sort of hung from the ceilings and all of that. Um, yeah, the photograph doesn't look great there either. I'm so sorry. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you go to my website, you can see this sort of collaborative work that I do in congregational spaces. Um, so let's move from season of creation to, this is the next one, I think. Um, so these are uh, two examples of the kind of contemporary icons that I make. Um, so I have two series that I've, where I've sort of used um, icons. So on the left, this is an icon from a series that I created called Icons and Illuminations. And it was, um, it was in the year after <laughs> I began the series with a icon that I created uh, from different photographs of the Women's March. And then from there, I sort of documented the first year of the Trump presidency through creating icons that engaged with um, this icon right here is um, it's a uh, it's from a photograph of Rohingya refugees uh, leaving Myanmar. Um, and uh, yeah, they were, there's a, it was taken from the perspective of a food truck uh, de delivering supplies in a, um, in a Bangladesh refugee camp. So that's, that's one example of that series. I also did, um, so it was icons and illumination. So I also did um, I would take like texts from different like speeches or different newspaper articles and would sort of illuminate them um, in the same way that, you know, medieval manuscripts were illumin uh, illuminated. So on the right hand side, on the left hand side, <laughs> no, right, sorry, it's on the right, it's Sister Carita Kent. Um, and so this was the first in a new series called um, a People's History of American Religion. And this is uh, Sister Carita Kent. She's a personal icon of mine. And so the idea for this series is I'm kind of soliciting uh, different folks and groups to um, give me the names of folks that they would like to see sort of um, memorialized in icons. So figures from uh, religious history who maybe have been overlooked or overshadowed. So Sister Carita Kent, um, I mean, she was very famous um, in some circles in the 1960s and 70s into the 1980s. Um, and her work has kind of had a resurgence, but um, still when I talk to my art school friends, there are very few people who know her work. Uh, she was at the time when she was sort of in her prime in the late 60s and 70s, uh, she was frequently referred to as the Catholic Andy Warhol. She has these really brilliant, vibrant uh, screen prints that she does, uh, that she did. She, um, she died of cancer in the 
in the 1980s. Um, she was also the art director at Emanuel Hart College um, in Los Angeles. And uh, so really taught like a, a, a generation of artists. And she's also uh, pioneered uh, the happening, happenings of the 1960s. So, um, uh, you know, it's something that is often thought of as having um, emerged from this like really crazy, like avant-garde uh, scene. And, and in reality, one of the leading uh, figures behind this sort of performance art uh, activism sort of movement was this nun living in Los Angeles who created these huge, you can see I incorporated some some images from uh, her Mary Day celebrations, which were these giant parades that she would um, organize with these really vibrant posters. And it's very, they're really, if you can, if you wanna look up photographs of them, they're just, they're really, really incredible um, photographs of these like sort of dour looking nuns and their, and their habits with these just like wild colors. And she really engaged with visual culture. And so a lot of her artwork has like Wonder Bread, um, like logos kind of throughout it. And it's like, um, Jesus is Wonder Bread, like she, Jesus is the bread of life. So, um, it's really fascinating the way that she, she played with sort of the visual culture of the 1960s and incorporated that into her artwork into, and into her um, theology. So we can move to the next slide, which, yeah, let's move on, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, I'm really sorry. I don't know what's going on with the, um, the image on the left. It is yeah. a- Sorry, Mary, it looks, it's right in the slide. It's just weird on Zoom. So we're not, we're not yeah, sure I don't, I, who knows? Yeah. Zoom has a mind of its own. It's totally fine. We're here to exercise our imagination. <laughs> so imagine, um, this was a, uh, on the left, um, this was from a, uh, uh, a set design that I made for uh, the Montreat Music and Worship Conference that happens um, every summer in North Carolina. And the theme was sacraments and seasons. And so I, I was like, well, you know, what is, what's some visual imagery that kind of can hold together all of the different seasons, like visually. And um, I decided to use Psalm 104, which is my uh, favorite piece of scripture. It's this, um, it's one of the creation Psalms. It's, um, I commend it to all of you. <laughs> Guessing most of you have, have read it if, if you're here. Um, but it's it has this beautiful evocation of uh, the cosmos and God at work throughout all of creation. And so I decided to take that theme uh, and really like play with it across all of the different um, seasons. Um, and so there are all of these different like star patterns for each of the different seasons. Eat, and I used those patterns and printed them on fabric. And so each season had its own particular textile. Um, and so, you know, they're hanging across the banners uh, across the stage and they would kind of move back and forth as we progressed from um, each each day of the conference was a different season, a different church season. So it they they kind of moved around, and like the 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 movement of the uh, the banners sort of uh, communicated the movement of the seasons too. And um, I decided to include this in particular because um, I use spoonflower.com which is you can upload very simple graphic designs and they will populate them in different sort of patterns and you can have your own material printed. Now, when I was in, and it's like canvas, it's linen, it's, I, you know, now they, you can print stuff on wallpaper. Um, and when I was in college, when I was at NYU, um, it was hugely expensive to get things printed that way. And, I, when I was working, I did some work with textiles when I was in college and I would use, you know, photographic 
photographic chemicals um, on fabric and print directly onto the fabric. Um, and that was really the cheapest way to do it. It was incredibly uh, time consuming though. And now you can get things um, printed relatively cheaply through uh, Spoonflower. And so like one project I have in mind is to um, collect children's drawings um, and uh, use children's artwork for each for different seasons and uh, print it on fabric and and create some banners that way. And so it's a really, it's, I can't recommend this website enough. I really enjoy it. Um, and it's, it's just fun to play with. And, um, you know, it's incredibly gratifying for people too to be able to um, see their work in different spaces. Um, and so, you know, my Stations of the Cross are collaborative in the sense that um, lots of different communities use them. And um, the ideas for uh, Christians to be in prayer together throughout the season, um, on particular, you know, around particular issues to be praying um, for particular folks. Um, and, and again, that some of my Lutheran background comes, comes into play there. Um, one of my favorite quotes is um, from Soren Kierkegaard, fear and trembling. He said, uh, prayer does not change God, but it changes him who prays. So, um, you know, I think through prayerful engagement and, I, you know, sometimes people are like, well, we need to do more than pray. And I absolutely, that's absolutely true. But I, I, I think that prayer is, is, you know, it's a verb. We, um, pray is a verb and it's, it's, um, I know that my heart has been changed too many times to count um, through prayer. And so, um, yeah, that's really how I, um, how I engage with, with my devotional art. And I kind of, I think that that's, I think that that's it. Um, I think that those are the four slides I have. I'm muted. I'm muted. Bye. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. You're, you're just beautiful. Uh, and I would say that Mary, with your pandemic hope series that we used on Good Friday, it was cool because the creativity in those inspired like our music director in terms of pieces she selected for the choir, which accompanied it. And then they inspired one of, we have a band and inspired one of the band members to compose some instrumental music. Oh, cool, and yeah. He, he put to it, which was kind of like the coda at the end of the service, you know, as we kind of faded to darkness. Um, so. Yeah, it's, I've, I've just, over the years, she's been so touched by the different ways that people have used the artwork to, to engage with their, their communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, one of the questions that came up in the chat, I'll share with um, each of you. So Colleen says, I like to represent art from around the world. Um, how do we best attribute art to the artists? When do I need to ask the artist for permission to use art? So uh, while we have the two of you here, the two creators, I'd love to have your sense of that because I think during the pandemic, people have been really scrambling for videos and images and, you know, and I think generally try to be careful about copyrights and attribution. And, but so for you yourselves as creators, um, you know, what, how do you approach that uh, on, on your side of it? You know, what is your preference, your requests, um, you know, in terms of the use of art? Joe, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I really try to attribute whenever possible. Uh, and it depends on where you get it from. Uh, if it's, uh, you know, if it's a site that's meant to be pulled from, then, you know, you attribute, you know, you say, okay, this is from, you know, from Unsplash by this person. But if it's, you know, I have found some some artwork on like Fine Art USA or I can't Fine Art America, and I've gotten in touch with the the artist to to use their work. So I would recommend whenever possible because this is this is their work. It's it's important. Uh, from around the world, I recognize that's a lot harder, but whenever possible um, to do that. Yeah, I I don't. Um... I'm, I'm not very picky about it. As long as people like credit my name, I'm totally fine. Um, people email me and ask for permission and they don't, I don't really need to. 
y'all feel free take whatever you want from my website just include my name bonus points if you include my website um but it really depends on the artist and if you have a name um then you know i, I would just suggest googling and seeing you know if they have a website there's an artist i know ben wildflower um ben wildflower ben wildflower dot com is his website and he does a lot of um does a lot of stuff around biblical themes and he actually has on his website um a section that says you know just credit me and so you don't actually have to email him to ask for um to ask for permission so um and some folks have that on their website at some point i'll update my website <laughs> my website to say that i think for the most part um artists are happy to see their work shared as long as you know as long as they're attributed and you know the thing is in this in this culture it is really um it is sometimes hard to track down um the originator of a work i've certainly had my work i have um i had a sticker that i designed a few years ago and um it, you know it was this little resistance is beautiful sort of image of a heart hand with flowers and um yeah, and I posted it and, you know, suddenly it was all over the place. And of course, my name and uh, website had been cropped out of all of its different like iterations. So, you know, um, you can always do a reverse Google image search. Like you can pop an image into a Google search and usually it will come back. Uh, you can figure out where the, the image originated from. If you're looking for resources for different artists, um, you know, the Vanderbilt uh, lectionary online uh, working preacher, like they often have like different sections for visual resources that um, go along with the lectionary. Um, there's also um, a group called Christians in the Visual Arts, um, SIVA, it's uh, C-I-V-A dot O-R-G is their website. And um, yeah, they're, they're a very good resource for um, currently, you know, active Christian artists from, um, I mean, there's mostly folks in North America, but there are also some, some global members as well. Um, so yeah. And I think, I think one of the resources that we've talked about when we were meeting was a sanctified art. Um, which is really rich resource as well, a sanctified art. And we'll is, yeah. put, these, put these in the comments or um, share these out. Uh, Sarah had a question. Uh, I'm wondering how we might use art to help people tell their own stories of the pandemic, especially children and youth. Um, um, yeah, so that's, um, there is like an engagement part of the, the stations um, from Pandemic Hope, which is that, with each station, here's like an example. This is an example of one of the prayer cards. And then on the back, there's, you know, a prayer and a description. And then at the bottom, each one of them has reflection questions. And so um, part of the idea is that like, as you work through the stations and you pray the different, um, the different stations, which people are always like, what does that mean? It's like, well, you look at the image and you say the prayer and then you, you know, you, you just look deeply right um and so that as you pray through the stations you can kind of create your own personal history um of covid um so i also have um as a part of this project has been been kind of creating been creating an um an oral history of covid for um, my own congregation here and that's um that's included having people respond to these questions. I also had um, during Lent uh, a, a, weekly, a weekly gathering that used the station's questions and people just shared their stories. And so um, compiling some stories from there. Another thing that I'm doing is just like pulling all of the different like rec like pastor notes in the newsletter and trying to um, when I leave, they'll have like a, a little, you know, a little jump drive with all of their sort of pandemic related <laughs> pandemic related stuff on, you know, the, the congregation that I'm serving was founded right before the start of the Spanish flu. And you look in their archives and there's 
there's nothing ab about it beyond, um, you know, baptisms and deaths and and um, so you kind of have to read between the lines to to um, get that story. So um, that's I'm I don't want that <laughs> for this congregation. I want them to have a resource so that future generations can can look back and know what this uh, time was like. Yeah, I hope that's, that's helpful. That's great. Some, somebody called the Spanish flu like the silent pandemic because there's very little left in kind of his, the, his, his, a lot of the congregations, there's very little to document it. Um, Joe, you talked about um, putting together um, the backgrounds with your daughter. You were painting the backgrounds to the advent. Can you just talk a little bit about, about that experience of being, engaging together and creating this? Sure. Um, I, confession, my daughter is a better artist than I am. <laughs> uh, so, we, from the time she was small, have loved to do art together. And as she's hitting those tween years, which, oh my goodness, uh, it's a struggle to find ways to connect. And so one day I'm like, all right, we're painting together. And so I pulled out all the blues and purples. Uh, we just have a huge thing of paints that we keep stocked. And so, and all of our brushes and some nice paper and some gold paint and I'm like all right just start painting and so we talked about it gave us a chance to talk about you know what advent is she's a double pk so of course she knows advent and but she's like why are we only using blue and purple i don't understand this um but it was it was a neat process and so speaking to the previous question one thing i've done in congregations before is you know when everybody can gather around tables again uh you know, having questions, I'll put a number of questions at a table and some uh, colored chalks and oil pastels and colored pencils and crayons and whatever, um, you know, all the mediums you can grab from your supply closet and have parents and kids uh, sit together and kind of pick some questions that they can talk about and then create an art response. Um, and so we've done that and then put them together in books and use them in slideshows um, and posted them around the church. And so that's another way if you wanted to have children engage with it, um, that's just a really simple. So you'd brainstorm the questions ahead of time to have these art responses. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thank you. See, we're, we're coming up almost to the, to the top of the hour. Um, so just want to have a couple of things to highlight here before we wrap up. Um, just to let everybody know our next webinar in June, on June 10th, uh, we're hosting Attending to the Self, Half Hel Healthy Habits for Sustainable Ministry. Um, and um, that's been, of course, self-care has been a, a challenge and an um, important topic through the pandemic. And um, that work is uh, not over. So uh, I'll be there um, with a uh, 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 Professor St. Louis, and we'll be talking about how we attend to the self. So that's coming up in June. Um, and we will make everything that we've named, all the resources we named, um, slides, video, in case you missed that earlier, we'll make that all available as a package uh, out in an email to you uh, very shortly. And just a reminder that we have uh, open office hours, uh, Lifelong Learning Department for Christian Formation and Discipleship on Thursdays from 1 o'clock to 2.30. So um, there are staff members from Lifelong Learning who are there and happy to talk about, you know, what you've talked, what we've heard about here today or any other topic that's on your mind in terms of your ministry, brainstorming, workshopping, you know, providing uh, support for you in any ways that we can. So those are open and available. You can just drop in and we'd love to see you. And um, thank you, Joe. And thank you, Mary, for your incredible work and the beauty that you're putting out into the world and for sharing your stories with us and your art with us. And, um, uh, and I'll just encourage a lot of people, I think we're checking out your websites as we were talking, but uh, I encourage everybody to do that because they're such uh, rich resources for those of us who, and myself included, are on the visually challenged side, or it's not our native language. Um, it's a great place to start with some, some beautiful stuff. So thank you both for, for all you do and for spending this time with us. And thanks to everybody for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, take care. Blessings. Take care.